Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. My name is Nick Cuts, and this week you're going to be hearing an interview that I had with producer and director uh, Jonathan Rockefeller from Rockefeller Productions about his musical of Winnie the Pooh that is uh, soon to be playing at the Riverside Studios and then making its way around the UK on a tour. So let's delve down into the 100 Acre Wood as we join Jonathan Rockefeller at the beautiful rehearsal studios at Dance Attic in Fulham. Hello, my name is Jonathan Rockefeller and uh, I'm the creator of uh, Winning the Pooh, the new stage adaptation. We are presently in the rehearsal room uh, where we've been rehearsing ready for the UK London debut, which we're incredibly excited about. I'm, I'm sitting here across from uh, Jonathan staring at all these kind of corpses really of of of, of one Ludwig was puppet. <laughs> um just you know the, the detail on them is amazing so tell us what we're well what i'm looking at right now yeah so you are looking at which is something we never allow people to see mm. which is the puppets not being puppeteered um all these puppets have been lovingly club crafted by our team at Rockefeller productions to resemble the characters that you know and love uh, we've interpreted that from both the Disney films, but also from the original E.H. Shepard illustration. Mm-hmm. So our versions of Pooh and Piglet and all the friends are sort of a hybrid in between, but they're puppeteered externally from the body. So you're not going to see any men in suits in this performance. Um, and the puppetry that these guys deliver, the performers, the puppeteers, the athletes, um, is really, really something else. It's the nuance in the emotions and the characters they deliver is fantastic i'm guessing jonathan your background is in puppetry because you you've done a lot of shows <laughs> with puppets tell us about your your previous projects yeah absolutely so we first started uh with the very hungry caterpillar which i thought was a tremendously wonderful book uh based on the brilliant artwork by eric carl that would look phenomenal on stage and so we that show has 75 puppets in it um, and what is tremendous about that show, apart from his works coming to life, is it's genuinely the first theatre experience that most children have. They, some of, they're still in diapers, they're still walking, or just learning to walk. Some of them don't even know how to read yet. And they love the show, and I love being able to introduce a new generation to the theatre that way. Um, so it was incredibly exciting to start with. Uh, we've also worked on Paddington Bear. We've taken him all around uh, uh, the United States and China and Australia very shortly. Um, and Sesame Street, the musical, is another one that is so much fun. Um, seeing all those Sesame Street characters, you know, Oscar and Bird and Ernie, uh, bringing them to life on stage uh, for the first time. And, and that's... So we like we like doing things uh, uh, that are unique and different and incredibly meaningful. And you're dealing with massive grands here. Aren't you? <laughs> so, <laughs> how do you go about working with with those products? I guess, or, or or brands, or do they let you do what you want? If you use Winnie the Pooh, for example, obviously it's it's Disney's thing now. Yes, we do work with a lot of incredibly known characters, and I think that that's. I mean, Winnie the Pooh was incredibly special because it's really the first time he's on the stage in in ninety five years, and he's um, since it was first written. So, to be able to do that is an incredibly um, wonderful opportunity to bring that to, to audiences who know those characters so well. So the expectations are high, um, and it's, it's up to us to really, really make sure that we can deliver something that is not commercial, that is wonderful, a wonderful experience that you genuinely enjoy. And that's always the challenge that, you know, these characters, you know, these characters so well that the audience are bigger critics than a, a critic will re- really be. And um, I, I can guarantee you being in an audience, if you've got uh, kids under five, they will tell you exactly what they think at the time. They do. They see it. <laughs> but also taking it on stage gives you things to do with a character that we've probably never seen before. You can take them on bigger emotional journeys and, and things like that. I think there's something incredibly special about seeing characters brought to life. Um, we often describe it as sort of animation for the stage, that this is as close as you can tactilely, tangibly be to those characters really genuinely coming to life. And when the puppeteers do their job, and they are brilliant, so often they've done their job very well, 
um, they disappear and it's just those characters moving and interacting with each other. And that to me is the, the piece of theater magic is when all the elements come together and the audience participates, they, they use their imaginations and we're all collectively in this sort of thing. And we tell this story together. Cause it's fascinating. If you watch Avenue Q or something like that, you're not watching the performance. You're watching the puppets. That's right. Because they are truly an extension of them and yep. their facial expressions might, you know, obviously the puppets can't do many facial expressions, so they'll do those. But is there, um, when you're dealing with a wide range of audience um, ages for this, are you saying we're doing this for everyone or is it specifically geared for a younger audience and does that affect the, the puppetry style? No, I mean, it is generally a show for everyone from all walks of life. Uh, we see very young kids come in. There's a lot of kids under 10 who are enjoying the show. But we see a lot of adults who have left their children behind or grandparents who come without their grandkids. And I think that's really wonderful that there's such affection for these characters and uh, telling the story. So it does affect some of the bits of the pacing, and but it's different levels. It's almost like a, a, a Pixar film, if you will, that kids will be laughing at some jokes and adults will be laughing and, and really appreciating that clever wordplay that A.A. A. Milne had in the original books. The other things that I think is earworms for everybody is those magnificent Sherman Brothers songs uh, that we ca it's, it's almost impossible to disassociate those songs from Winnie the Pooh these days. And we've also taken that a step further. So we've gone back and looked at A.A. A. Milne's text. We've um, created some more new Pooh's hums, as, as they called, or, or poems, but Pooh calls them hums. Um, and put them to music as well. So you're seeing the Sherman Brothers music with A. L. Milne writing lyrics, and I think it's a it's a fantastic combination to see them together. As a British audience, Winnie the Pooh has been Americanized over the last forty years or fifty years, or how long Disney have been doing. Well, I, I think that Gopher was yeah. <laughs> what is that? You know? <laughs> was a, was a geographical mistake. But the one thing that we've really made sure to do here is to take it really back to a lot of its roots. I mean, there's certain bits about Pooh, like Pooh's voice, that are synonymous with Pooh. But we've, if you look at uh, Piglet's uh, outfit or Rabbit, they're not, you know, they're not cut cartoon versions of it. It's very, very close to the original book. So we've found that sort of middle ground. The other thing is, is just we've been really genuine with the set. It is very whimsical and a magical place, as is the Hundred Acre Wood. But all the flowers and the woodland creatures are ones that actually exist in the Ashton Forest. So we've really made sure to make sure it is incredibly uh, true to, to what it should be when you were in the UK. So you work with the Sherman Brothers songs and you got new songs poems with music. We have a, a brilliant composer that we work with who's a long term uh, friend and collaborator called Nate Edmondson and he's done the beautiful orchestral score in the background where you will hear lots of hints of different music that isn't actually in the show so you'll hear refrains of Rumbly and My Dumbly and other things that or the New Adventures theme song for those who grew up in the 80s cartoon but it's, it's so subtle mm. that you've got to really really understand that so he took the AA non stuff and, and wrote the, the, the music for those pieces. And what story are you doing? That's a great question. What we did when we first approached this script is we took all the vignettes that are quintessentially Winnie the Pooh. So Pooh gets stuck in something. Rabbit's garden's going to get ruined. Ticket bounces and gets in trouble for bouncing. And have re-engineered them in a new way so that the story will feel incredibly fresh yet incredibly familiar at the same time. So that was our journey. But the, the, the base storyline is um, Pooh, who gets a small smacker of honey every single morning from Christopher Robin. Christopher Robin is not there one day because he happens to be off at school. And so Pooh has to take responsibility for himself and try and find some honey and gets along a lot of, well, you know, misadventures along the way. I have friends in, um, in the States who are massive Disney fans and suddenly all these kind of cute pictures of this little whimsical set starts to appear. Did it 
Did it go to Florida, or was that my imagination? Uh, so it debuted in New York. Yeah, uh, it's played in Chicago, and it's been on tour for right. the last uh, six months. So yes, it has. And what puppet gets the best reaction? Is it when Winnie the Pooh first appears, or? Tigo, I guess. I think it's uh, every puppet when they first come out almost gets a round of applause. But I think the sort of three big moments. I think when um, when Pooh first comes out, I think when Tigger comes out, and then when Rabbit comes out, because Rabbit is more like a rabbit and less cartoony. So it's this big sort of. I think everyone just wants to walk up to them and hug them because they're just so tactile and they look like and move like giant plush figures. And you do wish that they were your friends. You genuinely do. It's like going on the ride for the first time when you see these characters in 3D in the flesh. That's, that's exactly right. I hope you do photo ops after each show so the kids can go up and have photographs taken with you. We, we very much do. Lovely. Um, and, you know, we love actually showing them because some are curious how the puppets work. So we show them the puppets. Um, but they very... Uh, it's not just kids who like the photo op, by the way. Um, many a time there's been grandmas, uh, uh coming down or, or, par- uh, or lack of parents, parents, <laughs> lack of children's parents, I should say, who come down for the photo ops as well. Well, that's what's great about it, because it spans such a massive, not only to whether they, you know, the A.A. Milne novels or the, the, the short stories or the, the poems or, and then the, the Disney rebirth of it, I guess you could say, it spans multiple generations and cultures and countries doesn't it as i say it's massive in japan as well yeah it's it's almost like a rite of passage there that you get a winnie the pooh when you're younger um and here it's so wonderful to the pooh's home that there is you know everybody has either read the books or watched the cartoons or watched the films and i think everyone it you know i ask this question all the time when we first start rehearsals what's your first experience with winnie and the pooh and everybody has a different experience. And it's so genuine. Like, they all put a bit of connection to the characters or a particular character. And I think that's what adds to the joyful nature of the Pete. And now for many kids, their first experience of Winnie the Pooh will be this. Well, I hope so. Which is, which is <laughs> lovely. So despite your background and, and what you... Obviously, you theatre fan as a child, I'm guessing. What, what, how did you get into this? Uh, I actually started in film. And then it sort of gradually led my way to theatre because I, I don't know, lack of cameras. <laughs> <laughs> An audience every night making a different experience. Yeah, no, I think there's something really joyful about doing it live and hearing the reactions. So what's your role here? You're the director, producer, creator? A couple of hats, uh, but we have a phenomenal team and, you know, we work with a, a team called Wario who are uh, producing on the ground with us. Um, but yes, many, many hands. It, it's never a theater show like this is every single person puts their unique, uh, you know, art and craft into it to create that is from Nate, who I mentioned earlier, who's a brilliant composer, um, to the, to the puppets that are all built to the costumes. Um, everyone just does a fantastic job and we all service the story to create something, a, a beautiful piece of art that everyone can enjoy. What was stopping you doing an original version of Bunny the Pooh compared to Disney's version? Do you think that one is so iconic that it just wouldn't float? Well, I think I think uh, which Pooh stick would go first? <laughs> well, I think at the end of the day, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Now it's been with Disney for over fifty years, almost sixty. Um, it's completely synonymous with Queen of the Pooh. You can't see a Pooh without a red T-shirt on the voice and the voice and everything. So I think uh, I think that um, there's different ways to approach Pooh that obviously the books are so uh, present and that what A. A. Milne and E. H. Shepard created was so unique and special. Um, but the artisans who have created Winnie the Pooh and many, many stories and, and evolved... Um, our perception of what he is, I don't think you can really separate the two. Which is why he decides to go look at both. Which That's right. And, and, and a Disney overseeing this, or what, what was the, I don't want to say deal there, but what was the, how does that work with, is it licensed or? So we work in association with Disney Theatrical okay. Production on this. I think it's, it's incredibly special for everyone at Disney as well, is that, you know, they've had many, many hundreds of people touch the animation over the years. Uh, they're incredibly good 
the obviously the Sherman brothers that worked for Mary Poppins, um, and there's a deep history there. And Walt loved working with the Sherman brothers, as we know. And and I've always said Disney are the biggest single pushers of musicals in the world, and they always have been. They've continuously supported musical theatre, High School Musical, the stuff yeah. on Disney Plus, and it's great that they're still supporting it, especially with young talent such as, as you and everyone else involved. Absolutely, and I don't think we would have uh, musical theatre in the same ilk without the Disney films that came earlier, mm. training people that it's okay to have drama and singing songs in the middle of a movie. Well, and I think what also makes this incredibly special uh, about Disney history is uh, Winnie the Pooh was the last film that Walt actually worked on, and it, it came out just a couple of months after he passed. So he, he, it was incredibly special. It was very, just like Mary Poppins, he was incredibly passionate about getting the rights to it because he loved the stories to tell to his kids. Did you discover any cut songs that didn't make it in that you thought, hmm, we could try and use this? Well, I mean, there's so many wonderful songs. I mean, Rumbly and My Tumbly was one I mentioned earlier. Um, but, you know, Pooh's singing songs about eating. <laughs> Me too, that's so many times. <laughs> Uh, but he's such a fantastic, wonderful character. Um, and then that's also juxtaposed to Tigger's big bouncing songs and everything as well. So there's, it's a real cross section. You will go on an emotional journey and a nostalgic emotional journey. And it's very hard if you're a parent not to have a tear in your eye for the final scene. So you're going to Riverside Studios, Hammersmith, and then you're bouncing around the UK, aren't we? We are. I mean, it's so exciting that, I mean, always passionate about taking theatre to the people. Um, but, you know, being able to take us around the country uh, to Dublin as well and other uh, and across the United Kingdom. And it's it's just great that Pooh's here and we're opening this show and I cannot wait for audiences to see the production. So you opened it in the States. It's now here. Have you... You're Australian, I'm guessing, So, but you live in New York, is that correct? <laughs> I'm a dual citizen. Okay, so have you adapted any of the script? Are you, uh, are you seeing what works and what doesn't work in previous productions to make changes for here? We changed the spelling of colour. Okay. <laughs> that would come across well the dialogue. No, look, I, I think when we first debuted the show, uh, ultimately, Pooh is what Pooh is. We, we actually did the opposite, is that we brought in the very, very uh, United Kingdom version of the show to New York. And I think the only thing that's changed for those with incredibly good eagle eyes is we've replaced a football with a soccer ball. Okay. <laughs> or a football, as we call it. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. And what, what are you looking forward to seeing happening as we progress through rehearsals? Are there kind of bits you haven't looked at yet that you'll think, oh, I can't wait to see what the actors do with this. Uh, look, it's an incredibly challenging piece physically um, because not only are you singing and dancing, you're also manipulating this enormous puppet because, uh, you know, can't, some of them, one of them is 50 pounds. They're big. So they're, they're very large scale puppets. So it's quite physically taxing. So our rehearsal days are quite short. Um, and... Uh, we have to rotate performers through so we don't have any injuries and don't get fatigued. So that's always the challenge that we're not just rehearsing the show once, we're actually rehearsing the show three times over. Um, so that's always always a challenge. But uh, I think the performers here, I love hearing the characters with English accents. I think that's wonderful. Uh, oh, so, so they're not... Does Winnie the Pooh is a British voice or are they going with the... Well, Pooh himself is transatlantic okay. it was really the right you <laughs> um so it, it's he's always been sort of the bland that was first done by sterling collie way and then done by uh jim cummings and we've become that's very very familiar but it is great to hear you know kangaroo and roo and and rabbit and everything with british accents but is there a moment in the story that you're looking forward to seeing come on stage or have you seen it all already in rehearsals? We haven't started rehearsing Christopher Robbins yet, so we do that a little bit later in the piece and it's always magical when they come in because they're Christopher Robbins' age and when they start interacting with the puppets, that is always special. Do you think he represents the audience in a way? He represents the audience because we are all part of him, but the puppeteers, uh, their costumes are very symbolically the same colour palette as Christopher Robbins. 
Okay, so it's almost like his imagination is manipulating them when he's not around. Just looking around this room, it just looks it looks wonderful. It's just like a wash of nostalgia just pouring over me, and I'm sure that's what the audience will get as well. Oh, I love that. And then you just want to play with them? I do. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to end this now, and I'm going to put my hand off a rabbit. But thank you so much, <laughs> Jonathan. And... Uh, um, people can go to the website, which is winningthepooshow.co.uk and check it out. And I urge you to because I'm excited to see it. And um, I think everyone else is as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to Jonathan Rockefeller there for more information about the show. Of course, you can go to winniethepooshow.co.uk. Sounds charming. I can't wait to see it. Next week, Thos is going to be delving into the world of curtains, which is one of my favourite musicals ever, so I look forward to hearing those episodes. And coming up, I am going to be doing a tribute to a theatre that means a lot to me uh, called the Polka Theatre for Children, so look out for that episode coming soon. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Musical Talk. To find out more about the world of Musical Talk, you can visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk where you'll find all our episodes, or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Musical Talk.